Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all so very much for coming uh, to this uh, event that is co-hosted by the Claremont Institute and the Heritage Foundation. I'm Arthur Millick. I'm the Associate Director of the Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics here at the Heritage Foundation. Nothing could be more banal than to say, once again, in a grave and exasperated voice, that we're a polarized nation. All the TV people ceaselessly talk about political polarization and the need for bipartisanship. But this formulation is a hopeful one because it implies that our ossifying national differences are reconcilable. Not with ease, they say, but not with too much pain either. Yet it's entirely unclear that compromise is always possible. Just one example of this. Look at the deadlock over abortion, where the underlying question is whether there's a soul or not. And it's for this reason that the polarization diagnosis is almost always disingenuous and evasive. It's disingenuous because each side thinks compromise will come from the other side. And it's evasive because it looks at compromise only in terms of small time policy matters. In fact, the more we talk about polarization in this way, the more polarization seems, to, the more polarized we seem to become. For in avoiding confronting the real causes of our division, each faction grows more and more dissimilar over time, seeks to gain supremacy over the other, and ceases to see the other side as fellow countrymen. Some of the solutions offered by our nation's professional talkers are playground prescriptions. We need more face time with each other, more dialogue, more national therapy. Yet has deep disagreement ever settled this way? Few today admit just how vast is the divide within our nation. And this is the very purpose of tonight's panel. First comes the diagnosis over our real divisions. Then we will address how we got here. And last, we'll try to figure out what can be done at this point. Our panelists are uh, first, Michael Anton, who is lecturer and research fellow at Hillsdale College and senior fellow at the Claremont Institute. Second is Christopher Caldwell, a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute. And last is David Azarad, director of the Simon Center and the AWC Foundation Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Each will speak for about 10 minutes. Then Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute and publisher of the Claremont Review of Books, will take over to handle what I hope is an interesting discussion. Thank you. Michael. I've been asked to make the case for the existence of the Cold Civil War. That's what I was told to do. And I think I'm actually the wrong person for that, just in the sense that, to me, it's totally obvious and self-evident. Like, if you need me to make the case for the Cold Civil War, I can't persuade you. You are an ostrich. You are uh, a flat earther. I mean, you might as well get a geologist to come in here and try to explain to you that the world is round. But I'll do the best that I can. Um, so I think I came of age, I'm, I'm, you can see the gray hair, I'm fairly old, 49 years old. Uh, came of age and when this was all starting, when America was still kind of American and normal and recognizable and all these strange things were happening in my late teens and college years and stuff like that. Uh, for instance, uh, the Boy Scouts were still all boys then, uh, but um, the, the cultural left was, was working on it. Uh, they picked this fight sometime in the late 80s. It was raging through the mid 90s and the Boy Scouts now um, have decided that, I don't know that they've yet changed their names. It might be like fast food restaurants, you know, that used to be Kentucky Fried Chicken. Now it's just KFC. You're not supposed to ask what the initials stand for. Maybe somebody will just be BSA, and no one will remember what the B stood for. Um, gay marriage was just kind of starting to be a thing then, but still very controversial. Um, I think it actually got launched as a serious effort when Andrew Sullivan, who was then the editor of The New Republic, wrote a cover story arguing for it. And this was in the mid-90s, early to mid-90s. Um, but it was still like, okay for Democratic politicians to say, um, I have nothing against gay people. I just think that this is an unwise matter of public policy. So for instance, Bill Clinton signed the Defense of Marriage Act sometime in the mid 90s when he was the president. And that was not considered wildly controversial. Uh, California uh, passed a ballot initiative essentially ratifying the same thing in the, uh, in the 21st century. And uh, that was considered, you know, it was a little edgy, but it was not passed with a narrow margin of error. And uh, Barack Obama, uh, in running for president, somehow felt that he had to be against this in order to uh, be electable nationwide. Now, it took him about four years, and he came out, and he said that his views had evolved and so on. Shows you how things, how fast things move. 
And um, now it's, of course, we know because of the Supreme Court has a lot of cultural, a cold civil war issues are settled in that, uh, to quote Abraham Lincoln, in that eminent tribunal. Um, who would have thought, uh, but it became humongous, right, in 2015, 2016, that the question of which bathroom could be used would become a matter of national policy and debate. And we can kind of laugh about this and find it a little silly, but there were actually some kind of disturbing <clears throat> epiphenomena from this, because I, I remember, for instance, reading uh, an, an, a letter to the editor by a woman, uh, New York, a New Yorker from the Upper West Side. It had to be signed anonymously because she feared the repercussions of what would happen if her name were known, where she said, my daughter is like 11 or 12 or something and is in a swim program, a competitive swim program, uh, uh, you know, at, at an Upper West Side public or, or semi-public pool, and men now just go into the bathroom to change because they claim to be women and they just like to watch the, you know, girls change, and no one will do anything about it, and this is horrifying. And, of course, the, the wise and good public opinion said, shut up, lady, you, you're transphobic, you're just bad. Uh, and then I'm just going to mention a little-known one, but it's, it's part of this, right? Uh, does anybody, does the name Cecil the Lion ring any bells in here? So Cecil the Lion was an actual lion with a mane um, and a tail and claws and all of that. And there was a, some dentist from Tennessee or Kentucky or anywhere, some bad place, some red place, went to Africa and paid money to hunt and got a hunting permit and did all the proper things. And he killed Cecil the Lion, which is what you do when you go hunting with a permit. And it became a national story. And the man's life was ruined over this. Basically, there's a lot of people in this country who really hate hunting and hunters, and they thought you're an evil person, and they boycotted his dentistry, became a national story. Uh, all of that was yet another example of, I would say, the cold civil war. So I guess my next point is, this is all really elite driven. Um, to borrow a phrase, I think red America, essentially, you know, the one side, just wants to be left alone. It wants to kind of live the way it's always lived. Hunters want to hunt, and so on. Boy Scouts want to go, or the red Boy Scouts in any event, want to go and start campfires with boys only. And the blue, the blue side is the aggressor, I would say, in this cold civil war. And they will not tolerate that. You will not be left alone. We know better. We're going to make you live our way. If you don't like it, it's further proof of how evil you are. Now, Trump is, of course, a great example of the cold civil war finally sort of breaking out into national politics because his election represents many things. But one of the things it does reflect is the revolt of the Reds. It's a reaction of being told over and over again um, what to do and not liking it. And I would say the reaction of the Blues to that election is also telling in that they've not been able to accept it. Um, the sort of shock and inability to accept it proves that uh, they're absolutely convinced in their virtu virtu virtue and rightness. And just say, look, you know, it's like it's 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 like deciding the question of um, um, heliocentricity on the democratic election. You can't do that. It's a matter of scientific fact, and so on. And so, to not accept that is a kind of proof that you're insane, crazy, perhaps evil. And I, I would say the, you know, we got some ex interesting news over the last couple of days. Friday, the Mueller report was handed in, and then we get the Barr letter, and now we're seeing how it shakes out, and so on. But the, the whole Russia story is, in a way, a manifestation of the blue inability to accept even a temporary setback in the Cold Civil War. Well, there's got to be some other reason why this happened. It can't be that people are in legitimate revolt. So this was a, you know, a foreign power engineered this. Um, they've refused to accept the outcome of a democratic election. And, and they used the power. I mean, there's no really doubt about this anymore, if there ever was. I don't think there was. They before, during, and after this whole um, fiasco, they've used the power of the state and of the media to overturn the results of that double democratic election. And once this was all exposed as a fraud, uh, they've doubled and, and essentially tripled down and said, no, no, they've come up with a million reasons why they think it's all, it's all still true and it'll all be proved as long as we get the full report or something, you know, something's going to show it. Um, we also have another, I think, example. I'm going to bring it up even though because it's recent, it's kind of telling, right? Just, justice for Jesse, let's put it that way, right? So we see a guy, now, the, the initial hoax is itself an example of the Cold Civil War and that all these sort of, these hoaxes are meant to demean entire classes of people. In this case, I don't know how many people voted for Trump, something like 60 million, or maybe more than that. It's, he's essentially, I mean, when he says these are guys with wearing MAGA hats saying, this is MAGA country, he's basically trying to settle guilt on this entire class of people. So that's a provocation in the Cold Civil War. And having, you know, 16 felony counts 
brought against you. Maybe that's too many, maybe it's too few, I don't know. Um, but having them all dropped at the same time in an obviously corrupt, transparently corrupt manner, with political connections playing, is, a, is, a, is an example to me of one side of the Cold Civil War rallying around and defending its own. The other side doesn't really seem to do that very much, but we can leave that for another day. And, and since this is true, I'm going to bring this up. Um, the name of George Soros has come up a few times. Um, he gave $408,000 to this particular prosecutor. Uh, I've, Soros has been a bugaboo of mine for a while. But specifically bring it up now because um, so my mother is a fairly apolitical person. I would call her a moderate or centrist Democrat. Um, Sam Houston was the governor, is the only man to have ever been governor of two states. I don't know that this is true, but I think it's true. My mother is the only person who's ever the DA of two different counties in California. Uh, and she called me one day um, during la last year and said, I'm very upset. You need to do something about this. What, mom? George Soros is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to defeat all of these non-party, non-partisan races, all of them, by the way, to defeat all of these district attorneys in California. Some of these are very good people I've known from a long time. They're very apolitical and just get your friends to do something about it. I said, I'll work on that. But it, this is, an, I mean, that kind of money in, in races that were always um, highly, in, except in the big cities, San Francisco and LA, and these are highly apolitical races. You just try to elect the type of person who would administer justice the best. Now outside money is coming in, national money, to nationalize and completely politicize these races all in one direction, to uh, elect the leftmost possible candidate. There's another example, I think, of the existence of the Cold Civil War. Okay, my time is, is um, quickly running out. So I, I guess I'll conclude by saying one of the things that defines which side you're on is what opinions you hold. I thought I was clever about five or six years ago, and I, I, I thought I was coining a term, opinion morality. It wasn't that clever because some guy had already beaten me to it, and his phrase was virtue signaling, but he meant exactly the same thing. Your moral worth is not determined by what you do, um, the totality of your accomplishments, how well you behave toward your friends and family, how well you uh, meet your obligations, and so on. It is determined by what you believe, or not even necessarily what you believe, just by what you profess. I hold this opinion, and especially I hold it publicly, and I wave it like a flag. I am therefore good. We see that um, all the people who hold the right opinions are on one side of the Cold Civil War. They're the aggressors, in my opinion. And a, and a double standard applies, where they have a lot more leeway to do things that used to be considered immoral, but that are now considered you know, lesser tier of morality at best, but definitely trumped by the opinion. Um, so. If you really want to know, I, I, here's the, here's, I will leave you with a question. How does this end? In places like California, it ended with a complete triumph of the, the blue left. But that's because the, the right, center right, the red center right, I guess, could pick up and move to some other part of the United States. What happens when the blue left runs the whole country and everything? Um, is the, are all the reds supposed to move to Canada? I mean, there's a lot of hunters up there. Maybe they'll be welcome, some of them. Um, Canada has a history of welcoming disaffected Americans going back to the Vietnam War. Maybe there's some hope there, but I don't know that anybody's really thought this through. But I'll, I do know that right now, uh, the blue left is not feeling magnanimous or that, that you know it's time to slow down because we've consolidated a lot of victories. Their foot is on the pedal pretty hard and they're having fun and they're gonna keep going. And I, for one, feel a little bit of trepidation about what comes next. All right. Uh, I'm glad. Um, I'm glad Mike asked that uh, question about how does this end. I'm. Um, I'm a little bit um, uncomfortable talking about um, a cold civil war, um, uh, for for reasons that I'll explain. You know, maybe I could start um, by talking a bit about Abraham Lincoln. Now, you people might not realize this about me, but I am the fourth leading expert on Abraham Lincoln on this entire panel. <laughs> and, um, uh, but I, you know, when I think about Cold Civil War, uh, you know, I think about uh, Lincoln's house divided speech that he made during his Senate campaign against, uh, uh, against Stephen Douglas. Uh, in, in which he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And, and um, I think it's probably living as we do in the wake of the 1960s, we tend to look at that 
as a message being kind of like kind of a simple message, like we all really ought to try to be nice to one another. Um, but what what he was saying is, you can't have a you can't have one country with two constitutional logics, and that, and that was what he said. It's, it's a point that Mike was was, was getting at. You can't. Uh, uh, it's either going to be all one thing or all another. And I, <laughs> the reason I'm reluctant to, to, to use the term cold civil war is not necessarily that I don't think it's accurate, but I think of the reception of Lincoln's speech at the time. Uh, he was widely accused of wanting what he said he was only describing. And actually, once you in, once you put a term like that into play, once you talk about a about a cold civil war, once you talk about a house house divided, people do tend to view things through that that logic. So it's sort of a grave thing to do. And 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 and, and so I stress that I'm I'm trying to be only descriptive when I when I when I when I describe these things. But I, I think that if you want to look for the beginnings of this. Um, I think the 1960s are a, are a are a good place to look, and I think that that a lot of our divisions, the seriousness of the divisions. I'm not talking about political disagreements, which are always there. I'm talking about disagreements on fundamental principles, dis disagreements about questions like who belongs in my country with me, you know, um, questions like that. I think it begins. Um, in the middle of the 60s with the legislation that you have there. And um, what happened in the 1960s is that you got a new style of legislation, uh, uh, let's say, a new style of thinking about how the country was constituted, which was kind of at odds with the old style. And I think the archetype of this type of legislation is the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And what it did was it actually cast doubt on the, on, on the question of whether, um, whether the Constitution was being faithfully executed in the, in the United States. And it gave people, um, it, it gave a new force in politics, a way of overruling what a lot of Americans thought of as the normal way their country operated. Now, this I don't think is a matter of, I don't, I don't mean to question the aims of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but I think that it created a dynamic that, that created a lot of the problems we have. Because what it did was it permitted, uh, it permitted people to overturn um, uh, settled law in the country. It, it first of all it delegitimized settled, settled law in a lot of the country, and enabled people to overturn it and to create new law by suing. And so this was an alternative way to to legislate, actually. And at the culmination of this process, you have gay gay marriage, which which um, Michael mentions, where. There wasn't really even a feint at trying to bring this about by by legislation. This was all done through. Uh, it was all done through uh, litigation. Now, how is this a problem? It's a problem because when the legislation of the 1960s did not deliver results immediately, it was buttressed by, by other measures, things like affirmative action and speech codes. And these became vital to the project of transforming the country. And there was so much of this, and there was so much precedent moving its way through courts, and so much writing of rules from the federal government that you had a body of, you had a body of political thought that, and, and, and law which took on the shape of a constitution. And in fact, it was kind of a rival constitution. And it was about fundamental things because in the last 50 years or so, the rights won in the 1960s have come to be really fundamental to Americans' ways of, of thinking about themselves. So, you know, 
a conservative would look at the new dispensation and say, you know, my gosh, you know, someone just got sort of disciplined at Bowdoin for putting a sombrero in a drink and someone said it was was cultural appropriation and what what is this? What what kind of country is this we are living in? And the stony response of people in authority is, you know, I'm sorry, are you going to try to reverse the achievements of the last 50 years just so you can put a sombrero in your, in your margarita? So we're talking on two different bases. You have, and increasingly, the Democratic Party has become the party that defends the Constitution of 1964. And the Republican Party has become the, the party that defends the Constitution of 1788, of 1787 and 1788. So that, I think, is the situation that we're in. Um, and it does not tend to lend itself to compromise. But um, I'll let David carry on from there. Thank you. So I've been, is it on? Yes, I've been given the fun task, first of all, of going up after Mike uh, and Chris, which is a tough act to follow, and also in telling you how we're going to win this cold civil war in under 10 minutes. Um, I'd like to address what I see are the two central questions here. Uh, the first one is, what would victory actually entail? And the second one is, what would it take for us to win? Uh, let's start with the first question. I think you can define victory in one of three ways. The first one would be victory i.e. we win, they lose. The second would be permanent ceasefire, live, live and let live. And the third one would be secession. We go our way, they go theirs. Now, victory, I think, is obviously the most desirable outcome. In the simplest possible terms, it would mean that America is once again a conservative nation. It would mean the exact opposite of what we have today, namely progressive cultural hegemony. It would mean that America would once again honor motherhood and fatherhood. It would mean that we would honor excellence in all domains. It would mean that we would be once again a constitutional republic. It would mean that we would not tolerate illegal immigration of any kind or any violations of the law for that matter. There would still be a left and a right in America, and Democrats would still win elections. And let me reassure my liberal friends that although we would no longer worship at the altar of superficial diversity, the rights of all Americans would be secured under equal laws. That, after all, is the promise of America. But we on the right would set the limits of acceptable political discourse. Our pieties, not theirs, would be sacrosanct. Now, I know this sounds appealing, uh, but I think it's somewhat fanciful. I just, for once, have absolutely, I can't think of a way that we get there. I think it's worth keeping it in mind as a possibility uh, if only to kindle the imagination. After all, this is what the left does, right? These big, bold, inspiring visions. Think about it. FDR put out his second Bill of Rights in 1944. 75 years later, it's still not implemented, but it gets them all worked up. I think, therefore, in the shorter term, we should set our sights not on defeating the left, but on compelling it to moderate itself. That is, get them to embrace the live and let live ethos which they once preached. So under this scenario, we would still have red states and blue states. We would still have blue cities and crimson towns. What we wouldn't have are progressive zealots who are hell-bent on using the coercive power of the federal government to impose their vision of the good on every last county in America. Both the left and the right would embrace federalism and pluralism. Texas could be Texas, and Vermont could become Sweden. You pick... <laughs> You pick the issue, life, marriage, carbon taxes, school choices, Medicare for all, the minimum wage, you name it, we would let 50 flowers bloom, if not more. The right, as Mike pointed out, is already largely there. The goal is to compel the left to get there too. Now, there is a problem with this solution, is that in the long run, it raises the problem of, are we still gonna be a nation? What if we become more and more different from one another? And this points to the third so-called solution to the problem of the Cold Civil War, which some on the right, and now with the election of Trump, some on the left too, think is desirable, namely secession. Now, I don't think that would be a victory. I think it would be a disaster. It would mark the end of these United States of America.
I also would like to remind any possible secessionists in the room that once you let that genie out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. And what was once a great and mighty republic that spanned a continent would be reduced to an ever-growing number of petty and squabbling countries. And think, by the way, of how China would welcome and view this development. What we need to do then, I think on the right, is focus on the second option. Uh, we need to compel the left to become more tolerant and to accept pluralism. Now, you'll notice that I use the word compel because I think we are well past the point of dialogue and reasoning with them. There are still open-minded liberals, I know many, but their voices are drowned out by the intolerant fanatics who hate us. Uh, Ian Tuttle once wrote a line in uh, a National Review that I'm very fond of. He said, progressives have chosen an ideology of total warfare. They aren't satisfied with compromise. They aren't satisfied with surrender. They aren't satisfied until they're roaming the conquered countryside shooting survivors. How then do we force them to compromise? Well, I think we need two things. We need the will to fight and we need the means to fight. Now, many on the right, including my three fellow panelists and Arthur, already have the will to fight. They get it. They understand that the conservative project today is not a conservative project. It's a counter-revolutionary one. The problem is that many others on the right, especially amongst the intellectuals, seem content to fiddle while Rome burns. And like the political scientists that Leo Strauss made fun of, they're excused by two facts. They do not know that Rome burns, and they do not know that they fiddle. <laughs> they see no need for the right to rethink its strategies after a century of successive progressive revolutions. They refuse to see that almost every major sector of American life has been ruthlessly corrupted by the left. If we are going to win this cold civil war, we need everyone on the right to fight with the same intensity and have the same clarity of purpose that the left has. We need to galvanize the right. And here I must give a shout out to the left, which have helped radicalize many a young conservative after Kavanaugh, Covington, uh, Smollett, the Mueller hoax, and now Smollett a second time. So for that, we should thank them. But that is not enough because a galvanized right still needs institutional centers of power from which to mount a counterinsurgency. And here is the real challenge we face. We got loads of ideas of what to do about the country. The problem is all of the major institutions of American political life are controlled by the left. The media, K-12, higher education, the arts, Hollywood, um, Silicon Valley, Fortune 500 companies, large chunks of the administrative state, large parts of the Protestant and Catholic churches. I mean, there's basically one major institution in America today that is not completely controlled by the left, and that is the military. And even there, the top brass has shown itself quite eager to go left with the left social engineering. So what can we do? Well, there's one thing we can do, and we still do, which is to win elections. The problem is that we don't know how to wield power very adeptly once we're in office. I think we need to learn how to, better, how to govern better. So take, for example, the incestuous relationship between the federal government and the R&D departments for the left, our universities. Uh, not only do they get tax-exempt status, not only do we subsidize anyone who wants to be indoctrinated there by giving them loans, we also channel another $40 billion a year into research, large chunks of it that goes into supporting complete nonsense, social justice, woke research in the humanities uh, and the social sciences. And we've been talking about this since Buckley wrote God and Man and Yale and have done nothing about it. Uh, we need to go after the universities. And here I think uh, Trump should do to them what he did to the media. He should humiliate them. He should ruthlessly expose the charlatans and discredit them. And then his administration should develop an aggressive plan to force them via federal dollars and regulations back to their original purpose of promoting enlightenment. He put out a recent executive order last week, which is a step in the right direction, but a lot more needs to be done. In this area, as in many others, conservatives need to think through how to better use the formidable power 
of the modern administrative state to counter the left. Now, I want to make thing one very clear. This does not mean abandoning a commitment to limited government. It doesn't mean returning to the orgy of spending that was big government compassionate conservatism during the Bush years. The end goal has to remain the reconstitutionalization, there you go, I said it, of the federal government. It does mean, though, recognizing, and here I quote Mike in the latest issue of the CRB, that the United States is not now and has not been for some time a constitutional republic. I'd like to end on a gloomy note that uh, I think, however, should give us some hope. The left needs the post-Cold War, the real Cold War, holiday from reality to continue indefinitely. Progressivism is basically a luxury of a bored, safe, and prosperous people who have lost touch with necessity and who face no serious threats. 9-11, it turns out, did not awaken us. But you know what will? The rise of China and the impending fiscal crisis. What happens if China overtakes us economically? What happens when the Treasury needs to decide, do we service the debt or do we issue social security checks? We will once again then live in a world of real constraints and real threats. And that, I think, will do more to discredit the left and vindicate the right than much of what we can do in the meantime. Thank you. Well, that was excellent. Uh, first, I want to thank David and Arthur and the Heritage Foundation for hosting us here tonight and to uh, thank you all for, for joining us. I just wanted to say a few words uh, by way of um, advancing further understanding of this topic uh, and also uh, flogging, flogging the magazine the Claremont Institute publishes. Uh, I got a kind of snarky response to our invite for this event from one of our former fellows from a couple years ago. Uh, he'll remain nameless. But uh, he said, well, names. what? No, Mike wants names, of course. <laughs> uh, offline, no. Uh, his point was, well, come on, guys. We're supposed to be bold, or we can't win. <laughs> he said, uh, come on, guys. I mean, we don't have the other side of the Cold Civil War represented here. What are you guys doing? And uh, my response to that is that David and, and uh, Arthur and I did all this on purpose, of course. We thought, as you probably gathered from those remarks, that to understand this problem and the depth of it on the right is a more pressing uh, need. After that, we can maybe start talking to the other side about um, uh, David's plan for disarmament. Uh, I just point you to uh, a couple of essays. Angelo Cotavilla in 2017 wrote in the Claremont Review of Books an essay called Our Cold Civil War. Uh, Angelo's frame for all this is the ruling class. It's been his frame for the last 20 years. Uh, the ruling class versus the elites. Uh, and those elites are very much a bipartisan uh, affair, according to Angelo. And uh, Trump was just the latest, the election of Trump by, by a bare electoral majority um, was just the latest. And the American people's, or a substantial part of them, uh, their rejection of the establishment rule that's been um, instantiated over the last few decades, which Chris Caldwell touched on just a bit. Uh, I'll point you all as well. Uh, Chris has a book coming out next year. Keep an eye out for it. It's kind of a political history of the US since, since the late 60s, and uh, it will be excellent, I'm sure. Uh, the other essay would be um, Charles Kessler and Imprimus, uh, uh, maybe half a year ago, maybe sooner, I forget. Uh, our Cold Civil War and the Two Constitutions. Charles's frame, and it's uh, partly what he's been writing out for a long, writing about for a long time, is that the, the living constitution that was um, stood up at the turn of the 20th century uh, plays a big role in our divisions over our, our divisions in the Cold Civil War. And I think Charles's longer term frame can uh, accommodate and encompass uh, Chris's arguments about our turn since the 60s. Uh, and then finally, I do have to mention, because it would be um, ungrateful if I didn't, you all should read David Azarad's uh, I Identity Politics uh, essay he wrote for the Heritage Fo Foundation, published uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, it's essential reading, I think, to understanding the modern left. Uh, and without understanding, we can't really proceed intelligently in this whole uh, affair. So with that, uh, I'll say just very briefly, if any of you want to respond to each other, and then we'll open it up for questions. I have just a couple. Of... Hello. OK, a couple of points. First of all, I don't think Caldwell is right when he says that he's the fourth most accomplished Lincoln scholar on this panel. Azra is from Canada. 
<laughs> That's all I have. Uh, however, I will say in David's defense, I'm, I'm very glad that I wasn't given the task of explaining how we're going to win, because I don't know that I could have handled that one credibly. Um, and then I, I, I'll make this one point about what, one of the things Chris said. And I, I don't mean this really as a criticism. I just want to, and I doubt he's going to disagree. I just want to kind of make the point to fill in the context. He's totally right about um, the turn away from legislation to the judiciary, the turn to the courts, the overuse and the mendacious and harmful use uh, of, of um, litigation. Completely get that. I just, I, I, and I, as I said, I doubt he's going to disagree with this point. But suing can be okay for the right reasons. It can actually be useful if the purpose of the lawsuit is to force the government to live up to actual constitutional principles. That is what the court system is for. That's ultimately what judicial review is for. I mean, the supreme example of this is um, Plessy and the litigation launched, of course, by um, the civil rights movement before it became what it is today. But you know, the great work that Thurgood Marshall and his army of lawyers did was not to expand rights in a new direction that couldn't be won legislatively. It was to say, in, it was in defense of rights that were already uh, enshrined, not merely legislatively, but also constitutionally, and also, you know, being a Claremont trained person, I would say, the only reason they're in the statute and in the Constitution is because they exist by nature. And those lawyers were fighting for something that was real, that was being unjustly denied by statute, or in some cases by statute, in other cases by an unwillingness or an inability to live up to the statute. And then the last one, I'm just going to throw another dart Azarad's way when he says, oh, well, large parts of the administrative state are on the left wing side and large parts of the mainstream and the religious institutions and the churches. And I go, large parts, huh? Can you just, I don't know, I want to know what the small parts are that aren't. Can you just, can you name one or two names of some administrative state body that isn't uh, on the wrong side of this or some mainstream Protestant church? Or, you know, I mean, I guess it's apart from a, a couple of little... Um, uh, uh, rump Catholic sects, um, S-E-C-T-S, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that, uh, that aren't on the wrong side of this? I'm, I'm curious. I just meant to say that there are still professional civil servants in the government. Uh, not everyone is a politicized zealot who is trying to undermine the will of elected representatives. I mean, I'm not going to give you percentages, but from what I've gathered from friends who've served in administration, civil servants come in one of three varieties kind of what they should be with the progressives envisaged, competent, punctual, doing their job, useless, lazy, and unfireable, and then zealots. And the zealots concentrate, yes, in the civil rights division of the DOJ or the EPA, but I mean, they're not all corrupt, is what I meant to say. No, I've, and actually, I think I'm the only person up here that's worked in the federal government more than once, no less. Um, I ran across a lot of you know, the ideal, the archetypal civil servant, as you describe, they are kind of everywhere. I guess my point was more, there's no institution. No, they are. They're, they're all over the place. They're always outnumbered. And there's no institution within the federal government, certainly not that you would call part of the administrative state properly so termed, that isn't completely corrupted by this ideology. And the people who don't follow it and do what they're supposed to do are um, few and far between. And they're uh, kind of outliers and maybe even outcasts. Well, if, if I could, I'd like to, um, I would like to second Ryan's uh, uh, recommendation of Angelo Codevilla's work, which is deep and extraordinary. And he's got, he's, he's written a number of books in his, um, in his career, but I agree this book, uh, The Ruling Class, was it called? The one that came out just before the elections of... It was 2010. 2010, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a doozy. And so, when, you know, cold civil war is an, is an interesting metaphor. I think class war is another interesting metaphor. And, and, and this configuration that we have in this country is, 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 it's replicated in a lot of European countries. And I think that a particularly interesting instance of it is, is Brexit where there's a, there's a, if I may allude to, to, to George Gilder's article in the, in, in the latest um, CRB. No, not George Gilder, I'm sorry, Chris DeMuth, I beg your pardon. Um, in Chris DeMuth, is, uh, Chris DeMuth's article in the latest CRB where he, um, he talks about 
um, the tendency of, of Congress to give up its prerogatives and hand them over to somewhere, someone else. We obviously have that in this country. But in Britain, in, in Europe, it has tended to be uh, a handover to the European Union. Um, the British people decided in a referendum they don't want that. But the parliament now is trying to find a way to undo that, that referendum. So there is a real, this, if you want, you can call it a civil war if you like, but the class war element is just as, is just as important. A final thing I'd like to say is that I think it's very interesting David's idea of a live and let live option where, you know, Texas could be Texas and, and Vermont could be Sweden. I think we have that, we still have a vestige of that, of that situation, but it also goes to show why immigration is such a big issue in this country right now. Because I, I would analogize to the country before the Civil War when we were adding states and the fear of each side in what was then a cold civil war was that the other side was sort of bringing in reinforcements and um, that the strength of the other side was being, was, was, was growing day by day. And that gave the confrontation uh, an element of, of desperation. And I think that, 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 that immigration as an issue plays that role in our politics today. Thank you, we have some time for questions. Down here in the front. Please wait for the microphone. Oh, there we go. Okay, great, thanks. I, this was very good, I really appreciate it. Um, so I do think that you had multiple sides represented here, and I, I think it might be a generational thing, so I have really two very related and quick questions. Um, Mr. Caldwell had a theory of what went wrong. It's the 1960s. And I think he implicitly or explicitly tried to stave off what perhaps uh, Mr. Anton or Mr. Azarad might say as, uh, as their own theory, which is he says it's not, it's not the Civil War. But maybe it is kind of the Civil War because David's live and let live sort of theory uh, is kind of the copperhead sort of constitutional theory uh, that, that may not be feasible. So I guess my question is to to the two of you is, do you have a theory of what went wrong? And relatedly, uh, on the generational point, what do you do, uh, perhaps David and others, uh, with in the generational scheme with donors that are going to continue to give to educational foundations? They still want their name on chairs. What do you do about that? Um, you put them on some different chairs <laughs> would be my first suggestion. So as to what went wrong, if you'd asked me that question 10 years ago, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, probably not five years ago, certainly 20 years ago, I would have said with a totally straight face, uh, Machiavelli, by which I would have meant modernity writ large. It was all baked into the early, the premises of early modern philosophy, and, and it takes centuries, and they play themselves out, and so on, and we are where we are. Because the 60s don't just happen in the 60s. There's got to be a route to that, right? I, I mean, in that, in that I doubt something, although we've seen a ton of change in 50 years since the 60s, I, I don't think stuff like that comes about. I think deep intellectual currents take longer than that to play out. Um, I have become more sympathetic in the intervening decade or two to Nick and to the other early moderns. And so I'm a little bit more doubtful whether we can be that simple. But I do think there are currents that at least go back to Rousseau and maybe earlier than that, certainly to Rousseau and to that the sort of... Uh, um, you know, the ra rational historicism and that wave of, of modern thinking that gets you to the 60s, if you want to know where, where I think the, the deepest currents of it are. In the American context, um, there's no 60s without original capital P progressivism, which emerges in the late um, 19th century. Now, I, Azred's bristling over there because he's going to say, Anton, this is you being, you know, a sort of rote Claremont guy again and not giving the progressives their due. No, I've come around on that too. I give them their due to some extent. On public policy, they were way better than we've given them credit for in so many ways. And, and as I have heard it said, I won't say by whom, wouldn't you rather live with Teddy Roosevelt's progressivism than with today's? Well, of course, we all would, right? But their theoretical critique that they made, the analysis of that and how it devastated the constitutional order and corrupted elite thinking in the United States. I don't, I don't you, you, it's hard to separate that from their policies and the damage that it did. And there is no 60s without that. So we have to at least go back to there on the philosophic theoretical side. 
Yeah, although I'm not sure this, you need to have a 60s after the progressives. I mean, you could have had the New Deal and the Great Society without the New Left. I don't mean left. you need to have it, but that this, the, it, it didn't necessarily lead to it, but the 60s don't happen without it. I guess that's what I mean. Th that I'm less sure of, but I, I just think that the sexual revolution, identity politics, feminism, environmentalism are one set of, and the New Left are one set of animals and then, you know, kind of pre-70s big government, traditional redistributionist, faith in experts, uh, progressivism is another kind of animal. I guess my response to that would be um, what they share in common and where I, th I think that is very difficult, if not impossible, to disentangle is uh, what they, they just decouple morality from nature. Right? And they decouple elite thought, intellectual thinking. They decouple philosophy from nature. So whatever you want to say about Machiavelli and Locke and Hobbes and Spinoza and Montesquieu and so on and all of the regimes that they inspired and the, the practical people they inspired, the idea that you know, there is no nature, there is no human nature, we have nothing to learn from it, morality has, is not derived from it, that would have, they would have laughed at you. Y they yeah. would have laughed at that. Whereas by the time you're getting to the, the early progressives and certainly by the time you get to the 60s, they're laughing at the idea. I mean, they're hostile, openly hostile to the idea, and they laugh at the assertion that there's a connection. Well, I don't want to monopolize the whole, so we, I don't entirely agree, but we can continue this later. I <laughs> started in the back. This is also on the Live and Let Live. You remember four or five years ago when Indiana passed its RIFRA legislation and the, the, you know, the, the left went crazy with uh, a tremendous amount of pressure from corporations and the NCAA as well, does the fact that these national organizations and large corporations are full on with the identity politics progressivism render the, render the live and let live sort of state-based uh, uh, forms impossible? I don't know if it renders it impossible, but it makes it more complicated. And I just want to point out one th I'll let others answer that, your pr precise question. But one of the reasons to see that Indiana case as an example of a cold civil war is precisely the actions of the corporations that you mentioned and the hypocrisy of it. So one example, because it really tells a lot, right? Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, was absolutely happy, thrilled, eager, um, excited to punish Indiana for that and to, and to signal his virtue worldwide. I am punishing Indiana for being on the wrong side of a question, but I'm still going to do business with Saudi Arabia, which has a 50 billion times worse record on this precise issue. Why? Because he wants to wage war on that side of the cold civil war and the Saudis and the Saudi people and the Saudi ruling class, the Saudi royal family, they're just not combatants in the war. He doesn't really care what they do. It's all about sticking it to the enemy in the context that he sees of the war he's fighting. I think that's right. And <clears throat> it's, I, I think it's wrong to describe um, these corporations as going crazy, as if what we're talking about is a, is a cultural matter. I don't think it's a, it's a it, I mean, I, they do have cultural beliefs. Tim Cook might be an example of, of one who does. But one must remember that the federal government does regulate these companies. And they're very, they're very, Almost all of them are vulnerable to unfavorable regulations, unfavorable antitrust rulings. Um, and if, 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 a, if a White House is willing to express its policy preferences to these, these companies, there's, their hands are somewhat tied. Um, so they're, I'm afraid they're, they're not actually acting that crazily or, or rationally. Interesting combination, of, just real quickly. Um, Everyone should read this spectator piece called Woke Capital. I think that was the title of it from a week ago, maybe. So it's dual, at least. I mean, it's the sort of trajectory of our culture at the moment. Um, and the leadership has decided that uh, good HR is kowtowing to this new way of understanding. But also, he read in this, this piece in The Spectator, it's, it's amazing. It's really driven by the millennials who are at the yeah. bottom rung of those companies now. So in the UK, they have reverse mentoring where a millennial leads around a, you know, an old mm -hmm. uh, and teaches him the proper way of thinking. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. Yeah, I, it, I, I think that is right. And that's why it's not, I don't know that I, so I have to just agree maybe a little with Chris or supplement this. Um, yes, they're all afraid of federal regulation. I, I worked in some pretty big 
for, you know, companies into the Fortune 50, so fairly large for a while. I got to know these organizations and the sub-organizations within them that police this stuff reasonably well. Um, yeah, they're afraid. They're not afraid of, but they, yes, they are afraid of, and they want to satisfy the younger people within their companies. But they're, they're also, they're doing this for their customers, which sort of demanded, or at least their loudest and most vocal customers demanded. Remember also, if you're publicly traded, well, what are you dealing with all the time? You're dealing with the financial press and you're dealing with the analyst community, all of whom live in Manhattan, all of whom have the same, you know, they're on one side of the Cold Civil War. They have the same set of, no matter how rich they are, in fact, the richer they are, the more they think this way. And there is, so there might be this large blob of public opinion out there that thinks this is kind of crazy, but they don't matter and they don't have any way to register it. They don't have any way to hurt your stock price. Whereas everybody who does matter, everybody who can, who can affect your stock price, everybody who can affect your reputation, and everybody whose approval you desperately want thinks about it only in this way. And so that's why you play to that side. I, there have been a lot of us, I gave up this foolish indulgence long ago, but there were a lot of us who thought for a while, well, this is really dumb. How do you make money by pandering to this stupid type of sentiment that has to hurt the bottom line? Eventually, this will hurt them, and they'll wake up and realize they're alienating people. You know, for instance, um, Colin Kaepernick became incredibly unpopular by leading the kneeling protests and all that. Didn't really go well for the NFL. Nike signs him to this whatever deal, and they, you know, stand for something even if you lose everything. And everybody thought, well, this is it. Nike's going to blow up. It's all over. They finally alienated all of middle America. Ha, ha, ha. The backlash has arrived, right? No. Sorry, the backlash did not arrive. All the woke uh, right and good praised Kaepernick, praised Nike. The stock price rose. Their reputation rose. It worked out great for everybody. This is going to go on, people. <laughs> Just be prepared for it. Um, and there are structural reasons why it's going to go on and why they not only don't pay a price for doing it, they reap benefits from doing it. So, David, do you think the corporate... Wokeness is a bar to your federalism solution? I, I want to make clear, Mark, I, I, I'm... There are enormous obstacles to realizing, you know, my second best arrangement, and I only had 10 minutes, so I, I fully recognize the problem, and I'm, you know, on a good day, somewhat pessimistic. <laughs> Dennis, here, go Behind you. So, um, overarching a conversation about the cold civil war is civil war. Um, and I haven't, we've all sort of addressed, well, how do, we, how do we deal with this and can we do it and so on. But I would like to know what you think we can expect to happen with another 10 years, 20 years? Do we just go on indefinitely hating each other or does the situation of itself necessarily get worse or better or what? What are we looking at? Well, I think that the my guide in all things like this is um, the Gramsci formula, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. But I... Um, Like I say, you know, I think the, um, th this is a very interesting question about, about Lincoln in 1858, about what he thought was going to happen and what he, you know, whether he is to be blamed for putting this conception into play. Um, I th you know, the thing, I think as David said, I think that all of us sort of know how to behave to, to minimize risks socially if nothing changes. But the danger is that we'll hit a, a recession or some sort of, um, sort of some foreign crisis or something that, you know, or some accident that, that sort of changes the, the nature of the thing. That would be my worry, the, the, an unpredictable thing, uh, the sort of thing that you can't really plan for. I, so I will make the following analysis on, of Lincoln, and w without stating a conclusion or an interpretation, you can all draw from it whatever you like. <coughs> uh, it seems to me that what Lincoln was trying to do in 1858, 59, 60, 61, and, and let's say until March of 61, uh, was precisely live and let live, right? We're going to interfere with you in one respect only, which is, and not even interfere, right? It's not even an interference. If we have the votes to prevent slavery from expanding into the territories, that will be a democratic vote. It will be an expression of the democratic will. We realize that a, 
a large portion of the country doesn't want it, but sorry, you got outvoted. Chris mentioned the, you know, the, the issue of bringing in new states to upset the balance. Um, I, uh, a couple things about that. I'll try to be quick, Ryan. But um, first of all, that was a lot different then than it is now, just in that they were bring, there was a policy right up until the Compromise of 1850 that for every uh, you, uh, you, adopt, you let in states two at a time, right? One free, one slave to keep the balance in the Senate. And the Compromise of 1850 upset that by um, admitting California as a free state, only one state, no counterbalance. And without uh, a, a rule, California, up until the Civil War, uh, informally honored a tradition of always sending one pro and one anti-slavery senator. Uh, this is by the time the North had so outgrown the South in population that the House was lost. The House, there was no chance that the South could outvote the North in the House. They had to, they had to keep parity in the Senate. And Lincoln's policy was, we're going to leave you alone everywhere except we're going to prevent the expansion of slavery in the territories. The interesting thing about a House Divided speech is the one line at the top when he talks about placing slavery in the course of ultimate extinction. He never said that line again, ever, in the rest of his life, presidency campaign, ever. It was so alarming to the South that he got the message across as to what he really wanted. He said, if, all we, have to, if we can prevent the spread of this, it will eventually die without bloodshed and... We won't have to in interfere in the South in any other way. And that was unacceptable. Nets. So it seems to me that we've been talking about the progressives and the 60s and what's happening now. And it seems like we're forgetting a decade, right, which is the 80s, where conservatives did amass political power. Um, 49 states, right, went for Ronald Reagan not so very long ago. Um, so it seems to me that we had power, and then we failed to, to train that power in any meaningful way on these captured institutions that David is bringing up. Um, so I guess the, the, the more practical question would be, we, we still hold some amount of political power. How do we avoid making the same mistake as we did in the 80s, where we had a lot of short-term political victories, but long-term cultural and institutional failures to do anything about the problem, and we find ourselves, in fact, worse off than we were before the counter-revolution succeeded. Here's where I actually grow a little more pessimistic, like um, as David says, because I think that a lot of what happened in the 1980s, I think that, that Ronald Reagan was a much more consensual president than than it appeared i mean i mean i think that his rhetorical style could be quite polarizing but in fact if you think of the 60s as a new as having introduced a kind of an embryonic new constitutional order i would say that the politics of the 19 of the late 1970s you know of the period let's say, between Richard Nixon's resignation and Ronald Reagan's election, was so a boil with conservative, um, let's say, with re conservative rebelliousness. Um, and that really, that, that all simmered down when Reagan came to power. And I think that what Reagan did was that he found the resources to honor both constitutional traditions. That he, he totally respected the settlement of the 1960s in a way that those who voted for him had not expected him to do. Um, but he also um, became the president of pre-1960s America through generous tax cuts and things. But that was the beginning of serious deficits and it required it was not a self-sustaining program. And I think the difference between now and then is that we, we now, we're running out of the leeway to pursue that kind of uniting type of politics. In the middle, back here. Uh, thank you. So uh, my name's Stephen Taft here. Um, I, I think, I mean, it's fairly obvious to all of us, really, that what's just as important, if not more, than what we do is what the other side is thinking and doing. And um, it, can, it can often seem, you know, if you look at things like the Russia collusion idea or the plots of Hollywood movies or just the sort of cultural 
um, the narrative the left is telling that they're more afraid of us than they need to be. Like they, they give off that impression, like we're this great menacing force. There's some old white guy down in a basement somewhere who's controlling everything, you know, maybe it's Cheney or whoever. And uh, their, uh, their, their only hope is, you know, these uh, good looking people in these Hollywood movies sort of saving the day. And so, and, and then um, uh, some of you alluded to how, you know, chaos or uh, political instability or recessions is almost a, uh, to our advantage because, you know, then people have to tighten their belts and all. And so what I'm wondering is, you know, looking ahead, could they be, could the left be pushed to a point where they come to an accommodation with us because they are actually somewhat afraid of us, that if they push us, things might actually get out of hand and more to our advantage? Or is all of that basically not really sincere? And do they actually think victory is is theirs in the end if they just sit back and relax? Yeah, um, I don't think they're afraid of us at all. I think they're having a tantrum because they thought the final victory was going to be 2016 or shortly thereafter. And they're just brats upset at the delay. But they do expect final victory and they expect it pretty soon. And, you know, in the meantime, they're having trouble like children waiting for the lollipop until the end of dinner. Uh, they want it right now. And you do have to admire, one of my friends was having at a dinner this week, I won't say with whom, but the president of a very, very big progressive think tank in DC. And that woman was despairing over the state of the power of conservatives in America because we have the White House and the Senate. And one thing I admire about them is their kind of relentless, merciless, aggressive boldness. Like this Green New Deal thing is unbelievable temerity. No, but I mean, you laugh. We'd never do anything like this. I mean, to put forward a document like this, you don't even bother with the details, these grand visions to radically transform the country, and then you plow forward. They never rest. As soon as they've won on something, they take up the next cause, and they press it like it's Armageddon. I mean, there is a zeal to them that is, I mean, I mean, admirable in a, certain, in a certain sense that we tend to lack. In part, I think, just because we don't invest in politics the religious fervor that they do. Right, and that's just a question of temperament. I mean, I think that we think way too, people tend to think way too ideologically about politics. The, the, you know, the so-called right and the so-called left are not simply mirror images reflected across an axis. They're different cultures and 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 I think the left is generally a, a much more political culture um, uh, than the right and so you get issues like for instance let's look at um, let's look at you know like uh, let's say privacy and Facebook you know the, the most of the people involved with Facebook are on what you would call the left and yet most of the people with a plan to regulate Facebook or break it up or whatever are also on the left it's just and 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 the people you would call on the right just aren't really paying attention. So it's kind of Mark Zuckerberg versus Elizabeth Warren. And um, uh, what are Republicans or the right doing? Well, they're doing something in a totally different sphere, like maybe you know watching a baseball game or something. Yeah, sir, been waiting patiently. Oh, right behind you. Thank you. This is fantastic. Um, so David, you said something that I thought was very interesting. The right still wins elections, but needs to learn how to govern better. So I'm a huge believer in American exceptionalism. I also am not sure that the general sentiment of the public is something to be relied on. However, the alignment between the public's opinion of Congress at you know 10%, 12%, and American exceptionalism, exceptionalism feels to me like a huge misalignment. So I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts on governing better? And I don't care about left or right, but that will build more confidence of the American people that an exceptional nation has an exceptional national legislature. Structural, temperamental, something. I, I'm not sure I follow the question. I understand the question. I'm saying it feels to me there's something that's wrong when the American public has so little confidence in Congress. Have you seen Congress recently? I mean, I mean, if anything, 10% is maybe a bit high, no? Right. 
And and so when you were saying that there's a need for the right to learn to govern better, I I really again, just because the American public's opinion is low, I doesn't necessarily mean that Congress is so broken. But I'm asking do what, you what have I a, what I meant by this is uh, we and it's commendable on the right have this principled opposition to big government. Um, but the problem is is we have big government in reality. So when they're in power, they have no qualms about spending anything they want and issuing any regulations and putting any string in the world with the federal dollars. When we take power, we think it'll compromise our principles if we get entangled in the state. So let me give you a simple, I hope non-controversial example. The NEH, I don't know, spends what, three, four hundred million dollars a year subsidizing the humanities. They have no qualms when they take over about sending it to their friends. When we take over, we're like, well, we shouldn't be spending this money. It's unconstitutional. And it isn't. But we have had zero success in phasing out the NEH. And so we don't want to taint ourselves by getting involved. And as a result, the holdovers are still there. And even when we're in power, the money still goes to their friends. So either you get rid of it, which is would be my preference, but if we're not going to get rid of it, and we have had no success in abolishing agencies, eliminating programs in the past 100 years, let's use it to our advantage. Not lose sight of the fact that in the long run, we should get rid of it. But in the meantime, send it to support people who are actually doing real scholarship in the humanities rather than taking the principled position and it continues to uh, support bogus scholarship in the humanities. Time for uh, one more in the back. <clears throat> you know, it's an interesting historical question when our last American Civil War started. Did it start when the South started its bombardment of Fort Sumter or didn't it start earlier when the South in several states refused to accept the results of the 1860 election and declared themselves separate now from the Union. And so my question is, aren't we really closer to a hot civil war than you might think? We just witnessed the left, uh, the Clinton campaign, the Obama administration, and the deep state refused to accept the results of the 2016 election first by switching several electoral college voters, and then by this recently uncovered deep state failed coup attempt. I mean, aren't we really much closer to hot civil war than you guys have been talking about? I doubt it. Um, and that's the most optimistic thing you're gonna hear me say. Um, yeah, but not necessarily for optimistic reasons, but just for practical reasons the way I analyze it. Um, um, it, you know, it's hard to imagine any state, right? I mean, first of all, where does the hot in the start? I mean, people got to start shooting. So who's going to start shooting? How many of them? How are they going to be organized? Uh, well, if it's just, you know, um, some militias in the Rockies or somewhere, the feds can squash them like a bug pretty easily. And that won't even look like the beginning of Civil War II. It'll just look like and will be covered as and will be remembered in history as uh, crazy rednecks somewhere decide to take on the feds, get killed. Well, let's move on. Um, so you'd have to have some very large portion of the country, a whole state, one or two states, or a bunch of counties in one state, try to organize themselves politically to take that on. I don't see anybody even beginning to do that in the least way. Once the noise starts to get made that this is what they're doing, all of a sudden the entire conversation of the country will change as it changed when uh, states started talking openly about secession in the event of a Lincoln victory in the run-up to the 1860 election. And the conversation will um, the conversation having been changed so much, the political dynamic will entirely change. And, you know, the state that wants to do that or the counties may chicken out or the feds may find some way to shut it down or the surrounding populations may say, oh, I didn't realize we elected lunatics to the state legislature. We better calm this down before the 82nd Airborne comes in and, and occupies our state. So it seems like to me like we're a long way. I mean, you know, who knows? But it seems to me like we're a long way off from that. And I just don't, I sense a lot of discontentment. I sense a lot of people who want to be left alone. They don't want to be ruled. They're afraid of the feds. They don't trust their institutions anymore on all of that. But I don't sense any uh, sense, A, that people are quite to that breaking point, or B, and this is decisive, that they've done anything concrete to organize themselves in a way that would make hot civil war imminent. Anybody else want to touch that? I guess not. 
Well, uh, thank you very much all for coming and uh, join us for a reception past the front desk.